the services director here at Library Services at Lynn University. And thank you all for being here today um, and tuning in online, however you might be tuning in. Thank you for joining us. And this is our first faculty read series of the spring in this informal yet thoughtful series. We invite faculty to choose a few books that have influenced their career path or their life story or simply inspired them in some way. They have the creative freedom to interpret that invitation as they see fit. With each installment of the series, I personally have learned something new about each profession, professor or their research or their passion. And my hope is that you will too and also maybe add some cool books for to read lists. So we are featuring two psychology professors today, Dr. Connelly Beery and Dr. Chris Scribner. As for introductions, it's a bit of a faculty read series tradition to read reviews from the highly credible, peer-reviewed website, ratemyprofessor.com. <laughs> so let's see what some students had to say about Professor Beery. Beery is extremely helpful with everything and is willing to help you with life step two. Not just school reviews, though. Enthusiastic about her work and cares deeply for her students. Truly wants what is best for you and will help you to find a way to achieve that. She's the best professor I had at Linden. Very funny, knowledgeable, and makes classroom very interesting. Genuinely cares for her students and wants them to succeed. She was my advisor all throughout undergrad and would drop what she was doing to talk with me in her office. I wish everyone had the opportunity to take a class with her. And as for Dr. Scribner, Professor Scribner makes class very interesting and helps you grow as a person. He is passionate about what he teaches. His lectures are full of examples from his clinical experience, and he is always of assistance when you need it. He is very specific on what he expects of your academic work. But if you put in the effort to understand the material, grade will reflect that. By far one of the best psych professors. If you are interested in psych, take him. The hardness is worth the experience. <laughs> All right, without further ado, Dr. Beery. Thank you. Hi everybody, thank you for being here today and thank you Lisa for inviting us to participate in this. Um, the choice of books was a difficult one. I'm really grateful for having this exercise because it made me think an awful lot about the books I appreciated earlier in my life. Um, and the first two that I chose are books from sort of the late college, early graduate school time. Um, just a little bit of background. So as a clinical psychologist, we are privileged in a lot of ways to have conversations with people about topics that are often sort of socially taboo or difficult, right? And we get this social permission to have these conversations, which in some ways makes you bold, I think, um, in having conversations just in your everyday life. Um, and we are also sort of tasked with, or not just sort of, we're tasked with trying to reduce suffering, but also trying to help people thrive and help ourselves thrive, right? We are, that's, that help is part of our, kind of our mission as professionals. So um, with that in mind, I, I tried to approach these books in terms of thinking about how, how they influenced me to maybe live my best life, or how they could influence me or influence you to live your best life, you know? Um, and that's the lens through which I, I chose these books. So the first one is a little bit different from the second two. Um, the first one, Letters to a Young Feminist, uh, was published in 1998 by Phyllis Chesler. Phyllis is a, a psychologist by training. And at the time, 1998, I was in graduate school, right? I had graduated from college in 1996. Um, and during college, I had the privilege of working in a shelter for people who were surviving domestic violence situations. And I hadn't had, was fortunate not to have had abuse experiences of my own, but I witnessed the stories of many people in college who had gone through um, some really, really difficult, you know, horrendous situations and learned a lot from that, um, both 
both in a systemic way, kind of about the world as a young person, right? And also um, thinking ahead to the future and what I did and didn't want in my life and in all of the relationships that I have. Not just romantic relationships, obviously, but paying attention to things like power dynamics and you know, just things you're sort of noticing for the first time as a young adult. So I remember reading this book. Um, sorry, that's that too loud. I remember reading this book in graduate school shortly after it came out. And after I'd been sensitized to all these issues, you know, really learning about what feminism meant as a college student, I had a wonderful women's lit teacher who had this terrific class and um, introduced us to, you know, I was a naive, um, relatively privileged in many ways, young woman who'd grown up in this house that was totally supportive, um, so super lucky. And I didn't have some of the challenges that other people have Right? Um, so it was sensitizing. But this book came along in grad school and I thought, hmm, you know, that looks like something I might find interesting. Now, there are different waves of feminism, and I don't pretend to be a historian, um, but Phyllis really was kind of in that second wave, which was really like from the 1960s to the 1980s. She was coming of age, I think she was born in the 50s, and really became pretty active in that 60s to 80s time. So that was a big time of focusing on inequality, um, in the family and at work, um, just structural issues for sure, legal inequalities, right? Um, trying to rectify those things, being very socially active. Um, and I was after that, so I was reading her, and here I was studying psychology to become a psychologist like she is, and curious about how that would affect my work. And yet I had grown up in the 80s, really, and gone to college in the 90s, um, and I remembered so, so this book was helpful in a couple ways to me. A lot of it was history. And even though I'd had the women's lit class, which exposed me to writers I might not have otherwise come across, I wasn't really aware of a lot of the historical milestones that women had um, for, you know, for equality, women's rights milestones. And they're, they're encapsulated pretty well, a lot of them in this book. So that was helpful to me for sure. While I was in college, and before I went to grad school, the Violence Against Women Act was passed in 1994, just for a little bit of perspective. And I graduated in 96. And in 1996, the first women were admitted to the Citadel, for example. You might remember that, you know? And I remember thinking, wow, the Citadel. There are women, they may not make it, but they're, they're there, right? And that's kind of the last bastion um, for military education, I think, for women. So that was, it, I remember, remember thinking that was a huge milestone. Um, okay. From my own experience, though, growing up in really the 80s and the 90s, I remember things very early on, like watching women in my family um, having to wear super uncomfortable clothing to work, right? And like high heels that made their feet hurt, like every day. And spending lots of time on hair and makeup, which weren't exceptionally interesting to me, but I sort of recognized it might be a little fun, you know? But they were working on it really hard and wearing pantyhose. And I remember having to wear pantyhose in my first job because women couldn't really wear bare legs, you know, in work situations. And I remember even in middle school, um, I was in the band, and in the band, women were supposed to wear, we didn't have uniforms in middle school and high school bands, but we did have dress expectations, and women were supposed to wear skirts, not pants. You know? And I remember thinking, no, right? I'm gonna wear pants. And I was a flute player, so I was in the front, right? And I decided I was wearing pants. And I, I did that for me, but other people noticed. And I never got in trouble, strangely. I sort of expected to get in trouble. Wasn't really disappointed not to get in trouble, but you know, it didn't happen. So that was freeing in a way. Like, hey, I did it and nothing happened. I can push this, and it was no, you know? So anyway. College came, working at the shelter, being around women who were reading about feminism, kind of coming to understand what that meant and that it's not a bad word, right? Um, and thinking that I wanted to seek out other people who were supportive of equality in all kinds of ways in my relationships and in my spouse and stuff like that, right? Okay. Uh, let's see. So I remember this book really fondly. And then when I picked it up again, after I decided to include it for this particular thing, um, and I was rereading it, I was really struck by its power, right? And it's meant to be empowering. 
but it's also like super angry. And um, while at the time I think maybe I kind of needed that as a little bit of a push, I wouldn't want you to pick up that book today and think that I'm endorsing like all of that negative energy because there's a lot of it in there. <laughs> um, but, but it was good. So a couple things that she talked about that I think have been progress even since the time I was growing up for today's young women. Um, you know, thinking back to my, my parents, my grandparents, my grandmother's generation, women weren't allowed to really have careers. There certainly was no such thing as equal pay, right? Um, women not only had to dress in uncomfortable, uncomfortable ways, but they were treated like their sexual virtue was like all they really had to offer for to become a marital partner, stuff like that. You know, the message was very much that you grew up to become a wife and a mom, and those are wonderful things, but that that was it. And even my mom's generation, my mom talks about this as something, it's an explicit expectation she would take today. So I recognize that we've come an awfully long way, right? And even in my own family, we can see that. Like I was, my mom always, thank you mom, <laughs> really um, instilled this idea that you do what you want to do. You, you own your own future, you know, you're not, you're not, bound by the same expectations that I was, and that's a great thing. And I think if I had daughters, I would feel like that is still, we're still growing, we're still making progress, so that's really cool. Um, other things, you know, I feel strongly about the opportunity for kids to get a good, solid sex education in schools. You know, that's an outcome of this work that so many women have engaged in. Um, things like um, not having to be closeted Right, for our gay and lesbian friends. It's another big societal shift that's really happened in recent years, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, she also talked about how we should be careful not to cut each other down, you know? That this doesn't have to be a competitive effort, it can be a collaborative effort. And that we should work independently, but also well together when we think about accomplishing our goals. Um, we shouldn't exploit each other, for example. And that women can also be, she spends a lot of time on this, guilty of sexism and misogyny, just like men can, you know? Um, okay. She also speaks a lot about economic independence for women, and that comes back to equal pay, but it's more than just equal pay. That partners ideally should not be together just because of economic dependence, but we see that that's a factor, um, especially in, in some women's lives more than in others, and that education is one of the biggest things we can do to make sure that we have the independence to make the choices we make for solid reasons, not just because of economic dependence. Okay, so what did this teach me about living my best life? Um, it taught me that, and reminded me, uh, that we need and deserve the freedom to choose our own destinies, uh, including when or if we have kids. It reminded me that it's important to have boundaries and to respect other people, people's boundaries, for sure to not be afraid to call BS when we see it, but that's part of it. Um, and to have a voice and speak about issues that are important to us like this, the people in our lives. And to think about raising our children in a conscious way, aware of a lot of these things too. Um, one of my proudest moments as a parent <laughs> was when one of my kids overheard someone saying something like, you do that like a girl, you know? And he said, don't use doing something like a girl as an insult, right? And he was little, and I was like, I thought, yes. <laughs> That's a wonderful moment. So, um, and then lastly, really quickly for this one, this is so brief, okay? <laughs> but she said, Philip said, stand up as early as you can in life. Take up as much space in the male universe as you need to. Sit with your legs apart, not together. Climb trees, climb mountains too, engage in group sports, dress comfortably, dress as you wish. I love that. Kind of captures the spirit of the whole book. Okay. So, around the same time in graduate school, um, this book came out Tuesdays with Maury. Probably many more people are familiar with this book because it got a lot of press attention at the time. And it's incredibly touching. It's a memoir. And uh, just to refresh everybody's memories about it, it's about a relationship between two people, right? Um, Mitch 
had been um, a student of Maury's. Maury Schwartz was a professor at Brandeis University in the sociology department. And Mitch had been a student of his, and they had been close. He'd taken every one of Mitch's courses that he could. And uh, eventually graduated, and they had a very sweet moment at graduation, and he said, I'll keep in touch. And 16 years later, saw Maury on TV on Nightline with Ted Koppel, and another Ted Koppel, um, and realized that not only had he not kept in touch, but that Maury had really been very special to him. And he decided Maury was on this show because um, he was dying. He, he, was, uh, he was being very public about the fact that he was dying from ALS, and, um, and Mitch resolved to go and see him. So that began what became 14 meetings. Um, before Maury passed away. And the, the, the process of this series of meetings was super touching. So, let's see. Where to start with this? I feel like it's a wonderful story that depicts what Eric Erickson talked about with ego integrity versus despair. You know, he said that at the end of life, you can come to that place with a with a sense of peace and contentment and feeling like we've lived our lives well. Um, and that's that's the ideal, that's what everybody wants. And I feel like Maury really embodied that in many wonderful ways in this book. He was not afraid to talk about what was happening with him. And in addition to the understandable mourning that he was going through because his life was coming to an end and he wasn't excited about that, he was also though joyous and reaching out to people that had been important to him in his life and took advantage of their interest in him to reconnect, to say his goodbyes, to end his life in a really whole way, if that makes sense. So reading that was, um, at a particular time in my life, I was, I was anticipating the first major loss of my life in graduate school. We knew that someone was sick in our family. And so I read this at that time, and I was also in therapy, and I was in graduate school for clinical psychology. So it was just all these factors coming together. <laughs> it, was, it was not easy. Um, but it was a huge time of growth, too, right? Like, nothing prompts you to evaluate everything like that set of circumstances. Um, and so I learned a lot of things to sort of take with me, but really briefly, because holy cow, the time is going quickly, <laughs> faster than I thought it would. Um, a few things, let's see. Okay, so let's see, Mitch said, ALS is like a lit candle. It melts your nerves and leaves your body a pile of wax. Often it begins with the legs and works its way up. You lose control of your thigh muscles so that you cannot support yourself standing. You lose control of your trunk muscles so that you cannot sit up, or up straight. By the end, if you're still alive, you're breathing through a tube in a hole in your throat while your soul, perfectly awake, is imprisoned inside a limb tusk, perhaps able to blink or click a tongue, like something from a science fiction movie, the man frozen inside his own flesh. It takes no more than five years from the day he contracted the disease. Maury's doctors guessed he had two years left. Maury knew it was less. But my old professor had made a profound decision, one that began, he began to construct the day he came out of the doctor's office with a sword hanging over his head. Do I wither up and disappear? Or do I make the best of my time left? He asked himself. He would not wither. He would not be ashamed of dying. Instead, he would make death his final project, the center point of his days. Since everyone was going to die, he could be of great value, right? He could do research, a human textbook. Study me in my slow and patient demise. Watch what happens to me. Learn with me. Maury would walk that final bridge between life and death and narrate the trip. Beautiful, right? Yeah. So it's exemplifying the courage that personally I would love to have when that time comes. Um, and I think Mitch's willingness to be to open himself to this process and to his mentor and reconnect with him despite the fear he felt and the sorrow he felt, that kind of courage is what I would hope to also have for the people around me, you know, as they go through this process. Like there are so many lessons in, in this beautiful book um, about living and about being a psychologist too. You know, it's all kind of there. Um, let's see. What couple of the things that Maury did really well? He decided to have a living funeral, right? I think this obviously back 
think this book also affects how I thought about and taught the death and dying class for the years that I had it, right? Um, so this book, in part with the life experiences that I had at that time, opened me up to talking about dying in a way that a lot of people just don't. And I understand that. It's, it's really socially taboo. So there we go again with having talks about things people don't want you to really talk about. Um, but it's permission, right? And that permission opens up opportunities. So having a class like Death and Dying, where you can openly discuss all these things people are so afraid of, is critically important. You know? um, okay. Anyway, let's see. Oh, so the living funeral. He had a living funeral where all the people that he loved, he invited them to come because he thought that it was so tragic that people have funerals after they're no longer able to hear the wonderful things people applaud or that feel the love. So they did that, and it was a terrific success, and I applaud anybody who's able to go to something like that, because it's really tough. Um, let's see. I guess there's a lot more I'd like to say about this. He, he started meditation, right? Super cool. Uh, he invited hospice in. He had teachers come. You know, he was just really super open, which is a beautiful thing. So more exemplified dying well. What did it teach me about living my best life, right? It taught me to be bold, to turn toward scary things as much as I can rather than away, um, to live life with open eyes and an open heart and to keep connecting and to slow down. One of the things he said to Mitch is, if you start to live the way that I'm describing, you might decide you're not as ambitious as you used to be, right? So that's a good message too, I think. Okay, in my remaining time. so. Those two books I had already read for this project, but um, I decided, and maybe this was wise, maybe it wasn't, to use this deadline as a reason to complete a book, which I haven't done much lately, right? And this book had been like on my list um, on Amazon. It had been like in my, you know how you can save your cart? It was in my saved cart. I'd heard about it on NPR, and Stephanie even mentioned it one day, you know, and I thought, I'm gonna read that book. And then I thought, I'm gonna make that my last book for this day. So uh, it was kind of risky to pick a book I'd never read for this momentous thing. But I thought, what better, right? So here I am now. Those are books from before. And now here I am in my mid-40s, right? And I have this job that's super awesome. And I have a family that I'm crazy about. And life is good. But how can I keep growing, right? Like, that's kind of where I was. And, and that's why this book was appealing to me. Because I thought, hmm, well, couldn't seem to be a little happier, right? So the happiness project. This book came out um, originally in 2009, and then another, I guess, edition was published in 2015. Um, and it's the story of Gretchen Rubin, who made a courageous slash slightly manic effort uh, to do a lot of little things in her life that she, she did a ton of research. She's a writer for a living. Um, and so she looked into what she thought would be good, doable ideas for improving her happiness on a day-to-day -day or even moment-to-moment -moment basis over the course of a year. So it was a really ambitious project. Okay. Um, she really wanted to outgrow her limitations. She wanted to stretch. She wanted to grow. And I admired that about her. Uh, I think we can all do a little bit more of that. She said that she had a lot to be grateful for, and generally she described herself as happy already. But she said, what am I missing? Like, is this really it? Is this everything? You know? What more can I be doing with the precious time that I have? And I think that in that way, it's related to, of course, two days from work. Um, let's see. She asked herself a lot of questions. One of them was, is it worth the effort to, you know, can you make yourself happier? Uh, is that even really possible, or is it mostly temperament? And we know that temperament plays a role, but we also know that having a sense of control over your life um, the kinds of people that you choose to surround yourself with, those are very important factors in experiencing happiness in the course of a life. So she decided, uh, fortunately for us, that it was worth the, the effort. Let's see. She also wanted to prepare for adversity. And again, I think that reminds us of the Tuesdays with Maury idea, that eventually adversity will reemerge in our lives, right? It's never gone for good. And the more tools we have to deal with moments of adversity in our lives, the better off we and the people around us will be for that. Okay. So she had a lot of specific 
uh, suggestions and went through them month by month, and I'm not going to talk about all of them. There were many. I learned a lot. <laughs> uh, one of them, so she emphasized like getting enough sleep. It's funny enough, I talk to students about it all the time. I feel like there's one of the soapbox issues I have with them. <laughs> so sleep is big. Um, exercise, eliminating clutter. I discovered that I have nostalgic and outgrown clutter and not the other five friends. So, there's a lot of things. Um, she reminded us that sometimes we act because of how we feel, we act in a particular way, but we can also feel in a particular way based on how we act. So if we want to feel more energetic, sometimes simply acting with more energy in our lives in a conscious way can result in that change, and that's a fundamental principle in therapy too. Uh, she engaged in an exercise of reducing her nagging and not expecting praise or appreciation for the behavior that she engaged in at home, which I need to continue working on. I'm all aware. <laughs> uh, I thought that was actually really admirable. Um, but it made a big difference for her and in her relationship with her husband because she stopped feeling resentful that she wasn't recognized for the things she was doing to contribute at home. Another one that I thought was particularly useful, she talked about wanting to lighten up as a parent. And although I feel like life is really good, I do feel like sometimes I take things way too seriously and can be perfectionistic and um, even controlling. And one of the things that she talked about was trying to lighten up is by singing in the morning. As my children have become adolescents, the mornings have become even more difficult. They want to sleep. They don't want to get up and go to school. And there have been repeated challenges, especially lately, with getting out the door on time. Um, but I think I can find ways to maybe make that a little bit more lighthearted, at least for myself, and and keep that keep positive momentum going because I don't want our relationships to become dragged down by that challenge. Let's see, making time for friends. Pursuing a passion. She wrote a novel. I will not be writing a novel. But there's other things I do enjoy doing that I want to continue doing more of. I guess the bottom line is, and what, what does this tell me or remind me about living my best life is full of, books, full of ideas. Cultivating happiness requires effort and attention, and sometimes small changes can make a really big difference. Uh, my personal resolutions before reading this book included reading more and meditating more. But now I hope to also cut people more slack and lighten up more too when I can. Um, and that's really it. So I guess just in closing, I would like to say thank you and say thank you especially to Lisa um, for this invitation and the opportunity to review the first two books and the motivation to finish the third one. <laughs> Before you start, Chris, I'd like to open it up for Q&A. Um, I do have a question for oh, you, Colleen. Sure. How do you read? Do you read one book at a time? Do you print audio? How do you take notes? Mm. How do you, what's the process look like for you? It depends on why I'm reading, right? So sometimes, sometimes it's a single book at a time, and I'll read it from start to finish, although I find that that's less common now. More often, it's a couple books at a time, and they're at various stages of completion. And for like this, with taking notes, I literally read, and then sat down at the computer and took some notes, and read and took some notes. I don't do it in the books. That feels, I, I can't get over feeling like books are sacred, kind of, and I shouldn't be writing them. It's like I hate them. Uh, but it's true. So um, yeah, I, I guess it's a messy process a little bit, you know? But it was fun to it was fun to focus on this one book and have a good deadline for finishing the book. And like I said, one of the resolutions had been to read more, to make more time for reading. It's not just finding time; it's to make more time for reading. There's a, I'm one of the I have a ton of books that are in a pile waiting, and every once in a while I get to one. But it, it's like one of those things that I think at the end of life, one of the regrets I'll have is that I have not read all the books I wanted to read. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Anyone else for Colleen? All right, I think we're all ready for you, Chris. <laughs> I hope I can add one more person to that list. <laughs> um, all right, so in all of my classes, um, most of which focus at least to some extent on the, the varieties of, of 
of psychological suffering. Um, I like to introduce controversies, so I have to spend a lot of time talking about controversies in the class. And another thing that my students either love about me or hate about me is I'm very fond of asking questions that don't have clear answers. <laughs> uh, most of them hate that, but I like it. Um, I try to help my students shake loose from pre-existing assumptions that they have, and in the world of psychological disorders, there's a lot of those out there. <coughs> Um, and so that the flow of the classes that I often see is that um, I first learn a little bit about what assumptions students bring into the class with them, and then spend a period of time destabilizing them and confusing them. And I tell them, first day of class, there are gonna be times during the semester that you feel very confused about this stuff, and that's okay, because it allows things to rearrange themselves in a new form in your minds. That's how I justify. Um, I also try to focus a lot on um, helping people see that folks who have psychological disorders, although on the surface they seem very different from me and from us, um, in many ways uh, they're not. And I always um, have at least a little bit of an agenda to try to help people come to appreciate how people who are suffering from even these very unusual kinds of disorders are kind of like us in many ways, and to, and to highlight that. Um, and then that kind of leads into one thing that I wanted to talk about here. Um, this book, Lincoln's Melancholy, was written by Joshua Schenk. And um, I came to know Joshua Schenk actually in a different way. He's um, written a number of essays about his own struggles with depression. And so I've used some of his writings in some of my classes, and then I found out that he wrote this book about Lincoln. Um, it is a very readable historical study. Um, a study both of Lincoln and of melancholy, the thing that used to be called melancholy today, we often call it depression. Um, but melancholy is a much more rich, multifaceted term that has really kind of diminished and watered down when we refer to it as simply depression. Um, and part of what Shank does in this book is he highlights various ways in which Lincoln's melancholic character may have been an asset how it may have helped him accomplish some of the things that he accomplished both during his presidency but also earlier in his life. And I just have a, a very short thing that I wanted to read from this that kind of gives you a, a taste of, of what kind of approach um, Shane takes in this book. Um, so he says, biographies tend to conventionally be structured as crisis and recovery narratives in which the subject undergoes a period of disillusionment or adversity and then has a breakthrough or arrives at a turning point before going on to achieve whatever sort of greatness. Lincoln's melancholy doesn't lend itself to such a narrative. No point exists after which uh, his melancholy dissolves, not January 1841, not during his reign of reason in, the middle, in middle age, not at his political resurgence starting in, in 1854. Um, then he goes, I'm skipping a little bit here, but he says, whatever greatness Lincoln achieved cannot be explained as a triumph over personal suffering. Rather, it must be accounted for as an outgrowth of the same system that produced that suffering. This is not a story of transformation, but one of integration. Lincoln didn't do great work because he had solved the problem of his melancholy. The problem of his, of his melancholy was all the more fuel for the fire of his great work. And so the idea is that it's possible to take things that are ordinarily viewed in a distinctly negative light and identify ways in which they can actually be beneficial or assets to people. Um, and that's all I was going to say about the book. It's a really dense, it's a mystery. <laughs> um, next up, we have a book by Ethan Waters called Crazy Like Us, The Globalization of the American Psyche. I've actually used this book in multiple classes. That's how much I like it. Um, Waters re helps remind us that although the American perspectives on mental illness can be good, they aren't the be all and end all. And it's important to appreciate and recognize our own acculturation and to stay mindful of it as we work with or seek to understand people in other cultures who are struggling with um, psychological disorders. This message is for us to remain humble and to acknowledge there's a lot that we don't know and to appreciate that people in other cultures might have perspectives worth considering as well. In a little bit of um, background context, Colleen provided some context, so I will too. My, um, my major professor in college, my, my mentor in college, was a man named Dale Noy. 
And Dale was an interesting guy. He had um, graduate degrees in both social psychology and cultural anthropology. And so my introduction to psychology came from that side of the field, the part that abuts anthropology and is kind of interwoven with anthropology. Um, and this book um, takes that kind of approach. And so again, just a, a quick sample. Sorry. Um, he is talking about uh, the current diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder and kind of bemoaning the fact that as the field of psychiatry and mental health has evolved, more and more people have come to see the disorders as distinct illnesses that are probably biological in origin. And um, what Waters has to say here um, is the following. He says, in reading the best anthropo anthropological writing on the idioms of distress in other cultures, one is often struck by the richness of those psychological and social landscapes. The experience of horror or violence in these places is interwoven into religions, social networks, traditions, and rituals of burial and grieving. When one comes back home to PTSD, the starkness and thinness of the idea becomes glaringly apparent. In the modern Western world, the idea of PTSD is that of a broken spring and a clockwork brain. But by isolating trauma as a malfunction of the mind that can be connected to discrete symptoms and targeted with new specialized treatments, we have removed the experience of trauma from other cultural narratives and beliefs that might otherwise give meaning to suffering. Being value neutral to cultural beliefs is problematic given that these beliefs, be it God's plan for someone who's lost a child or patriotism for a soldier crippled in battle, are the very places where we once found solace and psychological strength. And so he's making a consistent plea to consider the importance of culture when we're trying to understand these disorders. Um, and I really like that broad perspective and the fact that it's kind of, kind of humble. Now, I'm gonna turn a corner here. Um, when I was trying to think about what I wanted to do with this time today, um, it, it occurred to me that in many ways, I uh, lead kind of two lives. Um, I have my psychology self and I read all these psychology books. Um, I'm a little hesitant to say this in a room that I know has two librarians in it, but um, I don't really read very much. Um, I read a great deal in my field. I have scads of psychology books, I read journal articles all the time. Um, I hardly ever read fiction. Um, I used to take one Jonathan Kellerman novel to the beach with me each summer and I would try to get through that in the week I was there. I don't read fiction. Um, I do consume a great deal of humor. And um, part of the reason for that is that I love humor. And I consider myself a humorist. Um, I enjoy writing humor. and. Um, the kind of writing that I do focuses on things like humor and satire and parody. I've published a bunch of stuff in a, in a few journals. Um, but the main form of writing that I have embraced, and the thing that's very special to me, is a form called light verse. Light verse, in case you're not aware of it, is um, poetry that rhymes and has meter. And it's usually humorous. It makes a humorous point. Um, sometimes um, light verse makes a very serious point in a humorous way which is even more cool. And um, from a fairly young age, um, I've been involved in trying my hand at writing light verse. Um, the very, um, I have one piece that was published in a journal called Light, appropriately enough, that I actually wrote when I was 16 years old. Um, and so it's been an interest going way back for me. Um, one of the cool things about light verse is that it's very well suited to being to being shared in a forum like this one. The poems are typically fairly short, they're humorous, they're lighthearted. So I have a bunch of things I wanna to read to you. Yes. Um, to start off, this volume is really difficult for the microphone. Um, there was a, a poet named Ogden Nash um, who was publishing his works between 1931 and 1972. Um, when I was a kid, there were lots of Ogden Nash books around the house. He was my father's favorite poet. My father was kind of into literature and English studies and so forth. Um, so we had Ogden Nash all over the place. Um, when my father passed away, I was 14 at the time, um, I took ownership of his Ogden Nash collection. So I've got a bunch of old Ogden Nash books now. 
And on top of that, his poems, because of their connection to my father, have kind of a special meaning to me. So he is a writer. Um, his work is famous for uh, its clever rhymes and its strange convoluted meter. Um, at the time of Nash's death, the New York Times in his obituary said, his droll verse with its unconventional rhymes made him the country's best known producer of humorous poetry. Um, I actually stole one of Nash's poems to use when I proposed to my wife. <laughs> um, and moving on. <laughs> um, you know how sometimes you hear a bit of music and it makes you tear up a little bit? This happens to me. It's not just me, thank goodness. And people will sometimes say, oh, because it's like a really sad song and the lyrics make you sad. And I say, no, no, it's the sound. The sound is what does it, okay? So that happens with me. And that also happens with me when it comes to certain rhymes. Okay, so I'll have this, I'll sort of well up with tears and it's like this blissful, feeling that the rhyme is just so stunning and so perfect that it kind of overwhelms me. And so when I was preparing for this today, I was thinking, oh God, what if that happens when I'm reading these poems? <laughs> um, so I figured I would just be um, very transparent about that. It might happen, I hope it doesn't, but it does. It's just a thing. <laughs> so you ready for some Yes. Right. Now he was, um, he was kind of an egghead, a lot of his stuff is sort of intellectual, and it's also important to keep in mind that a lot of these poems, um, I think both of the ones that I'm going to start off with here were written in the 1950s, and so there's a you know, historical era to consider here. Um, the first one is called Seeing Eye to Eye is Believing. When speaking of people and their beliefs, I wear my belief on my sleeve. I believe that people believe what they believe they believe. When people reject a truth or an untruth, it is not because it is a truth or an untruth that they reject it. No, if it isn't in accord with their beliefs in the first place, they simply say nothing doing and refuse to inspect it. Likewise, when they embrace a truth or an untruth, it is not for either its truth or its mendacity, but simply because they have believed it all along and therefore regard the embrace as a tribute to their own fair-mindedness and sagacity. These are enlightened days in which you can get hot water and cold water out of the same spigot. And everybody has something about which they are proud to be broad-minded, but they also have other things about which you would be wasting your breath if you tried to convince them that they were a bigot. See the rhyme there? Just being an idiot. <laughs> and I have no desire to get ugly, but I cannot help mentioning that the door of a bigoted mind opens out so that the only result of the pressure of facts upon it is to close it more snugly. It's pretty deep. Naturally, I'm not pointing the finger at me, but I must admit that I find any speaker far more convincing when I agree with him than when they disagree. So he's kind of highlighting a little truth. Um, the next piece, this one is kind of strange. It's called Caesar Knifed Again, or Culture Biz Gets Hep Boff's Prof. <laughs> you have strange titles. Um, to win the battle of life, you have to plan strategical as well as tactical. So I am glad that our colleges are finally getting practical. And I should mention this was written in 1957. It's an issue that's still around. <laughs> uh, if they are going to teach know-how, it's up to them to show how. And one way to do it is to get rid of dead languages taught by professors who are also dead but don't know enough to know it. <laughs> it's high time to rescue our kids from poetry and prunes and prisms. Once they start in on ideas and ideals, they'll end up spouting ideologies and isms. Get them interested in hotel management or phys ed, <laughs> business administration, instead of the so-called finer arts. And you'll cut off the flow of eggheads and do-gooders and bleeding hearts. Every campus gets what it deserves and deserves what it gets. So what do you want on yours? A lot of pinko long hairs or red-blooded athletes and drum majorettes? Another thing, now every autumn, it's like every coach had to open up a new factory. But get rid of the classics and he can play his stars year after year until they're ready for the glue factory. Because they can never graduate. But no crowd of self-appointed reformers can raise a nasty aroma because the reason they can never graduate is there won't be anybody left who can write the Latin for their diploma. <laughs> now let's all go to the victory prom and join in singing the alma mom. <laughs> the 
Um, he has, I might come back to this. I have some other ones lined up here, but I want to get to my other uncle too. He's got a whole series of very short epigrams that deal with animals that are kind of cute. And um, I also was presumptuous enough to bring in a poem of mine that I wrote that was patterned after Nash's style, so we'll see if we have time for that. But more important than that, um, Okay, there's one more Nash poem from a, separ a separate book here that I have. Um, this one is called Don't Cry, It's Blood All Right. Whenever poets want to give you the idea that something is particularly meek and mild, they compare it to a child, thereby proving that though poets with poetry may be rife, they don't know the facts of life. If of compassion you desire either a tittle or a jot, don't try to get it from a top. Hard-boiled, sophisticated adults like you and me, they enjoy ourselves thoroughly with little women and Winnie the Pooh. But innocent infants, these titles from their reading course eliminate as soon as they discover that it was honey and nuts and mashed potatoes instead of human flesh that Winnie the Pooh and little women ate. <laughs> innocent infants have no use for fables about rabbits or donkeys tortoises or porpoises, what they want is something with plenty of well-mutilated corpuses. Not on legends of how the rose came to be a rose instead of a petunia is their fancy fed, but on the inside story of how somebody's bones got ground up to make somebody else's bread. They'll go to sleep listening to the story of the little beggar maid who got to be queen by being kind to the bees and the birds but they're all eyes and ears the minute they suspect a wolf or a giant is going to tear some poor woodcutter into quarters or thirds. It doesn't really take much to fill up their cup. All they want is for somebody to be eaten up. Therefore, I say unto you, all you poets who are so crazy about meek and mild little children and their angelic air, if you are sincere, if you are sincere and really want to please them, why just go out and get yourselves devoured by a bear. <laughs> So that is kind of um, old style poetry. Um, now I have some contemporary poetry. Um, I mentioned that I've published a bunch of light verse and the journal that has taken the greatest number of my poems is a journal called Light, a journal of light verse since 1992. Um, it used to be a print journal, now it's online only at lightpoetrymagazine.com, in case you're interested. Um, and the, the other poet that I want to spotlight is Melissa Balmain, whose work I first encountered in the journal Light, and I absolutely loved it. Um, Melissa has since become the editor of that journal after the passing of its founding editor a few years ago. And when I emailed uh, Melissa to ask her permission to share a few of these pieces, she was absolutely tickled and she gave me her blessing. And then a few weeks later, I submitted a poem that I'd recently written to her and she rejected it. <laughs> so I'm not sure what to make of that. It's all good. They have very high standards of light. So this is from her book, Walking In On People. Um, and the first piece that I have is called Fed Up. It's kind of a common theme here. Red Riding Hood's grandma had chest pains galore cholesterol looming at 244, and blood pressure spikes. Though she kept it all quiet, her daughter found out and imposed a strict diet. <laughs> no more would she bundle Red off with a pail of cookies for Granny. Instead, she sent kale. <laughs> and casseroles ranging from foul to insipid because she had stripped them of every known livid. One day Red arrived to find Granny in bed. Come closer, my dumpling, the dowager said. Forget the lame cover-up tale that came later. No wolf gobbled bread. It was Granny who ate her. <laughs> um, and I, I should also mention that um, light verse often takes kind of a satirical tone. And for that reason, sometimes, although it's called light verse, it can be kind of dark. And there's a really cool juxtaposition of light and dark there that I enjoy. Um, as can be seen in this poem, it's called Bird in the Hand. It doesn't caw or hunt or fly. It can't peck anybody's eye or even grow a single lousy feather. One claw doesn't match for any tom. It's stranded on a leafless palm, regardless of the season, time, or weather. 
Yet what's the bird that all alone sticks up for you when jives have flown and you don't care to verbalize or linger? When someone's mocked you to your face or cut you off or swiped your space, what bird? The one that moonlights as a finger. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> this is actually um, the poem I was referring to that I, that I saw in light that made me say, I like this one. So it's titled, Epiphany While Reading People Magazine. If I could tra trade the things I own for all the stuff you've got, the gabled mansion on the Rhone, the 59-foot yacht, the gardens, pools, and tennis courts, the Prada evening dress, the chef who makes you salmon torts, would I find happiness? Would I be glad to leave the house that's kept me snug for years? To lose the shrubs I've pruned, the blouse I found half priced at Sears? <clears throat> Would I be gleeful as I fled my friendly neighborhood to join the upper crust instead? You bet your ass I would. <laughs> and the fourth one here is titled Lament. Um, this one goes out to any of you who have ever aspired to be writers. I know there's a couple of you in the room. So here's one. Mama never horse whipped me or shoved things up my fanny. She wasn't hooked on PCP and didn't bump off granny. Daddy never climbed in bed to open my pajamas. He read me Charlotte's Web instead. The bed he shared was Mama's. In college, I did not turn tricks or date warped literati. I haven't starved myself to sticks, joined cults, or loved John Gotti. The guy I married doesn't drink or French kiss other fellers. It makes me really sad to think I'll never write bestsellers. <laughs> so you get the point. So that was Melissa Bellamy. Um, Can I read a couple more? Should I open for questions? Can we please hear yours? Yeah. yeah. We would love to hear yours. But I would love to hear a few more, whatever you want to give us. And we'll okay, well, I'll, I'll do mine. The animal epigrams are literally four lines each. They're very quick. <laughs> oh, they brought this. Oh, there it is. Okay, so um, one, one form of light burst that I'm very fond of is to notice something in the news that strikes a chord with you as kind of funny or ironic. And so um, I was reading the newspaper one day and I came across an item um, that, and the summary of the article was, researchers confirmed that armadillos can transmit leprosy to humans. And I've heard about that. <laughs> the fragility of the leprosy bacterium suggests that infections result from something more than casual contact, doctors <laughs> said. <laughs> so I read this. And my twisted little mind starts going places. And uh, it eventually led to this poem that I call Armadillo Piccadillo. <laughs> um, again, patterned after the style of Octave Nash. That was my attempt, at least. All right, you ready? The leprous armadillo, unlike the lover who would traverse hill and dale, go to the ends of the earth, or leap across a canyon for you, makes a poor companion for you. <laughs> Casual contact is fine, but the libidinous seeker of carnal knowledge, the animal-loving moral boundary overstepper, risks becoming a leper. Better to maintain the pure holy lifestyle epitomized by Christ and advocated by Paul in his epistle of Paul to the Ephesians, if you wish to avoid skin lesions. If it's hard for you to remember important things, then next time you have a pen or pencil in hand and take out a pad of paper for aimless sketching and doodling, jot down as chew armadillo canoodling. <laughs> for it's widely agreed that Hansen's disease is not the sort of thing one wishes to contract as it's unhip, not groovy, and clearly neither the cat's pajamas nor the bee's knees. So if you chance upon an armadillo, feel free to stop and chat, have a polite and sociable visit, but nothing conjugal. 
for that would be just plain illogical. <laughs> and if your worldly travels lead you eventually to ride the roads of Texas, enjoy the blowing tumbleweeds, the endless horizon, even the lizards and armadillos. But for the latter, maybe bring along some antibiotic prophylaxis. <laughs> Okay, and then I'll just do one of the animal epigrams, and then I'll shut up. Okay. He has an entire book of these animal things. It's pretty funny. Um, this one's called The Termite. Some primal termite knocked on wood and tasted it and found it good. And that is why your cousin May fell through the parlor floor today. <laughs> so it's that kind of stuff. Okay, I'm done now. started even before then, but the first one that eventually got published mm -hmm. was when I was 16. And um, I'm just kind of curious, um, how did you get to the point where you can read your poetry out loud to an audience? I feel like that's... Uh, that awesome. took a little doing. Mm -hmm. um, I've been, you know, I've been writing for a very long time. Um, it wasn't until I enrolled in Lindenwood University's MFA in writing program that I began to get desensitized to readings like this. Because um, you do a lot of reading out loud there. Um, it is a little a little nerve-wracking sometimes, but um, that can be overcome by the enjoyment of sharing something that's special. So I guess that's how I get through it. Mm -hmm. And when, when you were a kid, did you keep a journal with all your poems? Or how, what did you uh, yeah, but it was really secret. <laughs> you still have it? Um, I, I still, at some point, I typed the stuff that I had written, so I have it on my computer now um, in that form. But there are some things, you know, going back to high school and college and so forth. Most of it's pretty bad. <laughs> pretty bad. <laughs> Except that one when I wrote with 16 was pretty good. <laughs> You want to hear it? Yeah. It's two lines. Let's do it. Um, the title was There's Hope for the Sexually Inexperienced. I wrote this when I was 16 years old and a virgin, <laughs> perhaps importantly. Um, and the poem says, Before pretty Eve was nigh Adam. Poor Adam was pretty naive. <laughs> Very good. Very good. So I channeled my adolescent things. <laughs> Other questions? I just had one more. So a spin off of the question of how do you read is how do you write? Are you a pen and paper guy? Are you a computer guy? And are you, when do you get your ideas? Um, when, I am, when I'm in an active writing phase, which I actually am these days because I recently got a gig writing um, satirical horoscopes for an online journal. Okay. And so I'm, I'm constantly running here. And what I found is most useful is I have a little battery operated recorder that I often take with me in my car especially. So if I'm driving and something occurs to me, I can just click it on and record it. Um, I'm also, my wife would confirm this, I'm very fond of using little schnooks of paper. So all around my house there's little scraps of paper that have ideas written on them and I try not to lose them. And eventually we'll compile those and put them in my computer in some form. Um, but I, I use a lot of paper and pen still. I find that that, that feels different than just typing into a keyboard. Very cool. Do you use a writing I, I do, although I try not to cheat with it. Um, I, I have enough integrity that I don't go into the rhyming dictionary and look for a really cool rhyme and then try to make a poem out of it. It's more that I'll be working on something and I'll realize the rhyme I've come up with isn't really great. I, I don't love it and then I'll see if there's an alternative that I can use. I also listen to rap music. There's a lot of good rhyming here. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? 
questions for Chris or Colleen? Thank you. Well, thank you again to both of you for your very thoughtful um, presentations. And uh, if you were here for the introduction, I mentioned that I always learn something new about every professor who contributes and participates in the series. And I definitely learned that Chris Scribner is a Pike First writer and has published many things. So um, if possible, if we can work together, Chris, after this, and we can, um, I'd love to have some lines, or some, sorry, lines, some links to where we can access some of your work and have that published with our online postings of this series. Um, awesome, awesome. So thank you all for coming. Thank you for joining us now. And I'd love to see you in April again when we host Andrew Malines and Ben Scholl from Arts, Media, and Communication. Um, so thank you all for being here. Thank you for tuning in online. And thank you again to these awesome professors for their great presentations.